I'll at least say this about this week's SmackDown. You had a couple of segments that you absolutely would have wanted to watch. You had a couple of segments that were worth the time. You had a couple of segments that were really good. The rest of it was easily missable, forgettable, and sometimes just plain crappy. So that's kind of what you get sometimes. Uh, yeah, admittedly, like when the show started and I saw you've got Bianca in the ring, Sasha's over there on one side, and Becky Cringe is sitting ringside. I said, oh, God. They didn't even bother going to the entrances being shown on TV. They just went right into this. Like, who keeps giving Becky Cringe a damn mic? Why? She is not good. Not good at all. And I still can't believe that there are people that actually try to make this goat argument for her. So, similar with Sasha. Because what, she's going to be around for two or three months and then she's freaking gone again. That's some type of goat. But back to the Becky Cringe stuff. The disco ball joke, that's really the best you've got? You wish you could pull off the look that Sasha Banks pulls off. You wish you could rock shit like she could. I mean, real talk. A disco ball joke? If that was written for her, that sucks. If she came up with this on her own, that just goes again to show how untalented she is as a promo cutter. Horrible. What we'll remember from this whole opening segment is Bianca basically doing the old Cena spot. She's going to put both of them up and put them through a table. I mean, that looked cool. That looked badass. Even though you didn't technically put both of them through the table at the same time, you get my point. Like, that looked cool. Like, that's a place where Bianca can shine. That's a place where Bianca can look like Bianca Lesnar, which, which is kind of what you should be doing with her anyways. Uh, so the culmination of it was good. But letting Becky Lynch have a microphone, let, let's not do, continue to do that. Could we please? Could we please? Uh, one of the big things, obviously, with this week's SmackDown was the, you got the start of the King of the Ring and the Queen of the Ring tournaments. And as far as the men go, you had Rey Mysterio versus Sami Zayn. Um, I, I think somebody pointed it out. It might have been good mic work. I, I, if I'm screwing this up, I'm, I apologize. I'm old. Uh, but he's talking about why would you put Sami Zayn in the tournament if he's not going to go to Saudi Arabia? You just put him in there so you lose him the next round? Yeah, so that's a great question. A incredibly valid question. And probably just something that Vince didn't even think about. More likely than not. I really want Ray to turn on Dominic, though. Not the other way around. Like here you could portray it as Dominic is trying to help Ray and it cost Ray and Dominic should have minded his own goddamn business. But... I think there's much more appeal at this point, to me at least, because everybody is saying Dominic's going to turn on Rain. We all know that's coming, but how great would it be if it was the other way around? Understand it's a bit risky with a Rey Mysterio, a proven commodity, a known star, a guy that still moves merch, so on and so forth. But now you've got the father-son dynamic. You know, the kid's not always the bad guy. And especially when you're going down the Little League dad approach, like, fuck. Rey Mysterio, as a heel, at this stage of his career, is infinitely more interesting. Especially if, especially if, and this is where it gets crazy, especially if you had him unmasked to do so. I know it never happened, but I'm just saying, I'd much rather have Rey Mysterio turn on Dominic than vice versa. Uh, Finn Balor versus Cesaro is exactly the type of TV match that, you know, those that really love the wrestling component of professional wrestling are going to enjoy. Uh, you know, Cesaro just kind of floating in the breeze, and let's see how big their plans are for Finn Balor. The Queen of the Ring first round match is the whole, God, different story. Zelina Vega versus Tony Storm. Hey, Tony Storm's on TV, and that was quick. It lasted about as long as most fellas would in bed with either one of these ladies. And you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. You know I'm right. You don't get paid by the hour, damn it. Get in, get out, and get the fuck on with your day. As a wise dude once told me, he used to tell his wife, he said, Bitch, you got 15 minutes. I'm going to get mine. You best show get yours. <laughs> um, but jobbing out Tony Storm? 
I guess you could say what difference does it make, but really, you largely haven't done shit with Selena Vega, and now you're just having her job job out Tony Tony Storm, like not even gonna give Tony a chance here. And when I look at the pre-taped interviews that they did, it seems like you're not giving him a chance. Whoever the fuck wrote those, like those are some terrible ass interviews or promos. Like who fucking talks like that? Who would say that shit? It sounds so scripted, so fake, so stupid. Stop it. Especially since this is pre-taped shit. Give them a talking point or two and let them flow. And if it takes several cuts, that's okay. They'll be much better off for it. Carmella versus Liv Morgan, another one. Blink and you missed it. This was some divas wrestling action tonight. The women going like two minutes or less. Uh, do they have bigger plans for Liv Morgan? Or are they just fucking around here trying to force Carmella down everybody's throat? I don't know. But that, that seemed kind of weird. Like now there's no payoff between Carmella and Liv. Happy Baron Corbin appeared, and that's about all I have to say about that. Remember when you used to care about what he did. It wasn't that long ago. But hashtag WWE ruins everything. So apparently, since Naomi can't be in the Queen of the Ring tournament for some unknown goddamn reason, Sonya has an opponent in mind for Naomi. And it's Sonya Deville. You know, if that means that Sonya Deville is going to start transitioning into a little more of an in-ring role, cool, whatever. You know, and I'm sensitive to the fact that, you know, she went through quite a bit to get back to this point. But why can't Naomi be in the tournament? Why is Naomi being saddled with this shit? Hashtag Naomi deserves better. Like, no, yes, we shouldn't always whine every time because our characters aren't doing exactly what we want them to do. But then there are sometimes you look at some things and they're so fucking egregious that you have to call out the bullshit when you see it. And this here is bullshit. Bullshit. Anyways, the two things that really mattered the most on this show was the Tribal Chief segment I posted on Twitter that summer was sleep for most of the first hour of Raw, uh, SmackDown. Almost Raw. Well, what the fuck was the difference with the first hour, really? You know, because the review of this show was very simple. Not enough Roman. But then Roman appears on TV, Summer magically wakes up and finds the powers, and you know we get more of what we would expect of this Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman combination. And you know, Paul Heyman, in his acting in recent weeks, has been top-level stuff. This is truly some of the best work he has done in years. His presentation, the way he's conducting and carrying himself, the way he went from being a hype man for a Brock Lesnar to a loyal, like, in love almost damn near manservant for Roman Reigns has been something to see. And the message that he delivered to Brock Lesnar, like, that shit fucking fucked. Like, this has been fantastic. I can't remember the last time I was this into something that Paul Heyman was involved with. And you'll wonder why. Because it involves the tribal chief, Roman Reigns. Acknowledge him, Devin! Acknowledge him! Because what would you have without him right now? Think about that. Roman brings that main event big fight presentation every week. Heyman is doing a magnificent, masterful job of building on to that. The other big thing and really good thing on this show was the stuff between Seth Rollins and Edge. Seth Rollins calling out Edge to come to the ring and face him. Says, I'll even let you name the stipulation for a match. Takes a few minutes, but Edge eventually comes, spears him, all of this, to announce the stipulation of the match at Crown Jewel. It's going to be hell in a cell. And it's like, holy shit. A feud that has reached a point that actually qu classifies as being worthy of a hell in a cell match. What a novel fucking concept. Hey, you guys know I'm not the biggest Seth Rollins fan by any stretch of the imagination. But his work here in this program with Edge has been really good for him. This program with Edge might be the best work I've seen Seth Rollins do in years. It may arguably be, from my perspective at least, 
his best work as a singles performer in WWE. I am interested in this story. I am engaged in this story. It is also nice to see Edge back in this spot because it's a, it's a show, it's a brand, it's a company that needs star power, legit star power whenever they can get it. And Edge certainly brings that to the table in spades. And one of the things that really makes me happy about Edge being back at this time of his career, at this stage, at this roster, is that Edge stands out more. And it allows us to better appreciate, I think, just how big of a star he is in relation to the vast majority of the rest of the roster. Like 10, 15 years ago, he was a, he was a big deal. He was a star, but like he had other dudes. But it's striking when you see Edge. Like, this dude is an all-time great. No, he's not like top five, top ten, anything like that. But when you look at all the wrestlers and all the history of the business, like he absolutely is an all-time great. Ability to work face and heel. Ability to cut effective promos on either side of the fence in a variety of different ways. He's had different characters. He can still go in the ring. Like He looks legit. Like He acts legit. He walks legit. He works legit. He talks legit, like everything about Edge is fucking legit. And that's carrying over here to Seth Rollins and it's elevating his game. Now I was hoping that this was gonna happen with the Seth Rollins and Edge story. Does that mean I'm gonna be very interested in Seth Rollins after this Edge program? Absolutely not. But for a couple of months, it has at least started to make me care about something that Seth Rollins is involved in, which indeed is a very, very, very big deal. This was a great close to SmackDown. Like your one hour main event segment with Roman and Paul Heyman and your main event segment with Seth Rollins and Edge, this shit was fantastic. If you had a couple other really good things on this show, it would have been a great episode of SmackDown. Your opening segment though was cringy because you continue to give the cringe god Becky Cringe uh, a live mic for whatever reason, I do not know why. And other than Bianca doing some Cena-like impressive physical shit, like, we'll forget about the rest of that segment. The King of the Ring, Queen of the Ring matches certainly were nothing to write home about. Um, seeing the vignette for Hit Row, hey, that's kind of cool. You know, don't just randomly have them debut, like, build up to it. You don't have to go there right away. Don't go there. Create a little buzz. Try to create a little excitement. Try to help them stand out from the crowd a little bit. Cool, I'm down with that. Um, there were good things on this show, though. It was good enough. And a couple of the things were really, really damn good. 